car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Got in a really interesting topic of conversation, ID theft and everything you need to know to protect your rights and make sure that you are safe and you're protecting um, your, your finances, your family, all what ma matters the most to you. So here's how this is gonna work for the next half hour, ways you can communicate with us at the bottom of your screen. Also something really cool that Hollis Wright, the law firm makes available each and every Sunday evening. Lawyers standing by live throughout the program to speak with you. That conversation will take place off air, so um, no need to worry. We're not all going to hear it, um, but an opportunity to speak with attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live tonight. Leading our conversation, as he often does, he's the managing partner of Hollis Wright. Josh Wright, good to see you, sir. Good to see you, too. Hope you had a great week. I did indeed. Thank you. You know, um, we have done shows before related to protecting yourself against identity theft, whether it's account takeover or application fraud. We're going to talk about those things tonight. Um, but we're lucky, again, because we've got Micah Atkins on, and Micah does an incredible job in this area. Um, and, you know, it's an important topic. Uh, it when is. you look at the statistics of the number of people in your neighborhood and my neighborhood who have some type of identity fraud mm -hmm. that could impact them, um, it's staggering to think right. about that. Uh, I can tell you that we personally uh, have had an issue in the Wright household related to somebody filing a tax return on our behalf and didn't realize the world of this and how significant it was until we went through that. And then all of a sudden, you've got all these things you got to do different to make sure you protect yourself. So mm. uh, it does happen. And so it's an important topic. So Michael, first of all, welcome. Thank you for being back on. I know you've been on a ton and we appreciate you talking about this. And the reason we have you on a ton is because you are the expert in this area and we have a lot of people that have this issue uh, come become kind of an issue for them. Josh, thank you and to your firm for having me on. Uh, it is a, a very timely and relevant subject identity theft, especially given the recent Equifax data breach affecting yeah. so many millions of Americans. Tell the viewers just a little bit about kind of what you're doing with your firm because your firm has exploded in a very positive way over the last several years and the growth that you've had and how you're taking the concept that you became an expert in that was kind of local here, Birmingham, all over the place. So my firm, the Adkins firm, represents consumers, specifically victims of identity theft and consumers who have errors on credit reports or background reports. My practice is 100% litigation in federal court, which allows me to uh, practice in various states, not only in Alabama, but also I maintain an office in Texas and Dallas and Houston, and now also in Brentwood, Tennessee. Well, congratulations. I know it's been great to watch your growth. I talked to you a little bit before we started uh, on this. Let's talk, let's kind of jump off here into this concept of identity theft. And where do you see this happen most often? I mean, is it, you know, somebody submits an application on your behalf for a tax return? Is it, you know, identity takeover where they take over your identity and they apply for a credit card? I mean, what, what, what do you see most? There is no one stereotypical ID theft situation. It comes in many shapes, forms, and sizes. Uh, for example, you gave with the tax refund. It's very common that identity thieves will file a tax return on a victim's behalf before the victim is able to file their return. That's one example. We're also seeing uh, identity thieves apply for employment using uh, consumers' personal identifying information, such as a social security number. And then thirdly, uh, we do see the financial situations where an account is actually opened up uh, using the victim's name, social security number, those types of things. So what do you recommend when somebody just sees you, gets to know you, realizes what you do, what do you recommend just generally to people on how to protect themselves? So one of the first recommendations my firm makes to our clients is to go get your credit reports. Get your credit reports from the big three nationwide consumer reporting agencies, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. Review those reports very carefully for any errors. If you have errors on those reports, then dispute them to the credit bureaus. Mm -hmm. And you've got the ability to do that through some type of dispute process online? So consumers can make disputes in various mediums. <clears throat> for example, they can make a telephone dispute. Okay. They can make a dispute online. However, my firm recommends to our clients to always make your dispute in writing by certified mail. 
And that's important for a couple of reasons. One, it creates a paper trail. So we know exactly what information the consumer mm -hmm. communicated to the credit bureaus. Likewise, the credit bureaus will scan and save that dispute letter and their database. So in the event that the case goes to litigation, we'll be able to get those documents. Do they have an obligation to actually <clears throat> investigate the claim and reach a conclusion? How, how does that work? So, yes. Okay. And uh, the term of art is actually reinvestigate. Okay. So the consumer reporting agencies have to reinvestigate the disputed information because it should have already been investigated before the information was placed onto the consumer's file, right? So likewise, in addition to the duties that the credit reporting agencies have, the companies who supply that information to the credit bureaus also have a duty to investigate okay. once they're notified of a consumer dispute. So explain this concept of the Equifax, Equifax breach. I mean, we think of Equifax and TransUnion and the others being able to help us, if you will, protect ourselves against identity theft because we're going to them to evaluate our credit report, those types of things. How can they be exposed to this type of fraud? Well, the fact of the matter is any company yeah. uh, is vulnerable for this type of fraud. Uh, with respect to companies like Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, the consumer reporting agencies, David, Josh, or myself never asked these companies to store our most personal, private, confidential information. They chose to do this and to sell it. And if they're going to do that, they must keep that information safe and secure from identity thieves. So in that scenario, even a company <clears throat> that's trying to do everything they need to make sure that they're secure was exposed just like you and I could be exposed. Exactly. That's scary when you think about it. I mean, it when you really, there, there's, there's, I don't know if there's irony there, if it's unique to, to kind of look at how that could happen, yeah. but there, it's just amazing that these thieves are as smart as they are, that they have the ability to go crack in and breach information that we all trusted was safe at a reporting agency. And, and they seem super aggressive because it, almost every week there is there seems to be a data breach. And and like, kind of like what you were touching on, the folks that we, we trust our information with, from a <coughs> consumer standpoint, it really sounds like who, who's out for us and who's looking out for our best interest because um, whoever's kind of guarding the store right. is not doing a very good job of it, apparently, from a consumer standpoint. Would you agree? Uh, agreed. And, and in fact, the statistics show now that you're more likely to be a victim of identity theft than to be in a car wreck. So it's going to happen. Not surprising. More likely yeah. than not. Obviously, with 145 million consumers yeah. who are victims in the Equifax data breach mm -hmm. uh, and possibly more, um, it's inevitable that you will be a victim of identity theft. Um, one of the issues that I know always comes up when we talk about this topic is when should you get a lawyer involved on your side versus when should you not do that and, and how that lawyer gets paid in this setting? Sure. So uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is not a strict liability statute. So just because the law has possibly been broken doesn't mean that you immediately have a claim. Um, however, the statute is written in a way that it, it provides consumers with somewhat some due process rights. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, you have the right to get your credit report. Right. Uh, you also have the right to dispute errors on your credit report. And thirdly, you also have the right in the event that the consumer reporting agencies or these companies supplying this fraudulent information to the credit bureaus, if they don't reinvestigate, don't perform a reasonable reinvestigation, don't reasonably investigate the disputed information, then that may trigger a claim under the Fair Credit Reporting Act mm -hmm. against these companies. So let, let's do this. I know we're getting ready to go to break. Mm -hmm. When we get back, I want to talk about how Micah and, and people that do the type of work he does, how they're compensated to allow consumers to hire them. Right. Um, and let's talk through that because I think that's kind of an important issue and maybe a, a misunderstanding some people have. We'll pick up right there whenever we come back as we head to break. A, a reminder of how you can join our conversation. Also, Hollis Wright. Very active on social media. You'll find them on Twitter at Hollis underscore right. And uh, some 1,200 folks are uh, uh, friends and, and like them on Facebook. So join that Facebook community as well. Just search the term Hollis right. Find them there on Facebook. Stay tuned. We've got more of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. 
Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis rightcom and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys. Welcome back in to the attorneys, a topic of conversation tonight. Boy, that seems to affect all of us in one way or another. If you are sitting there and a, a question pops into your mind and you'd love to run that by an attorney, remember attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by even as we speak and throughout the program. So pick up the phone and give them a call. Josh. All right, so when we went to break, I wanted to make sure that we talked in this segment about how a lawyer that does the type of work that you do, how someone can get a lawyer involved without having to come out of pocket to do that. Because in my world, in the civil world, we deal in contingency fee contracts where we pre-fund all the litigation expenses. And of course, we're not compensated unless we're successful in the case. It works a little similar in your in your world too, does it not? It, it does, Josh. In fact, the <clears throat> excuse me, the federal statute that I operate under, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, has what's called a fee shifting provision. And a fee shifting provision is just this, that if you're the successful litigant, if the plaintiff is successful in bringing a fair credit uh, claim under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, then the plaintiff's attorney can petition the court for a reasonable attorney's fee and cost. And so what that allows me to do as a civil litigator mm -hmm. is to represent my clients on a contingency basis where they don't have to come in and pay a retainer. They don't have to advance my expenses up front and they can hire me on a contingency basis. Well, and that, that changes the whole world of changer. being able to get a lawyer involved mm -hmm. to help pro kind of protect yourself. And if you found yourself as part of uh, some type of identity theft process, you want to make sure you get counsel involved early. Yeah, uh, a question we've got here about uh, kind of the, uh, how does this uh, uh, identity thievery work? Um, how does an identity thief actually steal someone's identity? How does that happen? Uh, again, David, identity theft comes in all shapes, sizes, uh, and it happens in many different ways. Sometimes in low tech means, for example, someone may steal your mail, steal your trash, and have uh, identifying information there, or it may be more high tech. Uh, it could be a handheld skimmer that a waiter or waitress, when you give them their, your card, your credit or debit card, they put it in their apron and swipe it through the skimmer. Uh, we've also seen skimmers at uh, gas stations mm -hmm. and ATMs uh, as well where it actually reads the card data off the magnetic stripe on your card. Crazy. Uh, I get concerned, and maybe th this is wrong, but I mean, I get concerned that if my social security number is turned over, if somebody gets access to that, that that alone can be used for identity theft purposes. Is that, I mean, is that a, a concern? Should that be a concern? Absolutely, and in fact, they don't have to use your exact social security number. Uh, one method of stealing someone's identity is called tweaking where they actually tweak your personal identifying information. Maybe they change one or two digits of your social security number. Uh, but that is a, a valid concern. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you go in to um, a doctor's office and they insist on you providing your social security number, you don't have to do that. Uh, that's generally uh, something that is done to uh, skip trace or find you in the event that you don't pay your medical bills. Um, explain this to me too, I know when a lot of times we will call and order something online with a credit card and they ask for the credit card number, they ask for the name on the card, they ask for the um, zip code mm -hmm. and a lot of times they'll ask for that personal identification number, the three digit or the, the security digit, number on it. Security number. Right. Is, is that dangerous? I mean I, I know we all do it but is it dangerous? Absolutely. Okay. So we need to guard our private personal information 
and limit who has access to it. And so instead of maybe you're ordering a pizza and you want to call and uh, provide your card information over the telephone, uh, it actually in that scenario may be more secure to go online and order the pizza so long as it's through an encrypted, yeah. uh, secured website. Huh. Hadn't thought through that. That's probably that's probably smart. Yeah, all of those, um, um, any, any little tips like that could be helpful. Another question um, we've got here, are there specific things you should do in regards to stolen checks and debit cards once that happens? Yes. Specific moves. <clears throat> so for, first with checks I've, and, and debit cards for that matter, you need to notify your bank immediately um, so that the bank can close out the, the card, the account number with the checks, the routing, et cetera, associated with the stolen checks. Likewise, with debit cards, unlike credit cards, uh, you have more liability risk. Uh, <coughs> so in other words, if you don't notify your bank timely, then you may be on the hook for all the fraudulent transactions right. that were made on it. So it's imperative that you notify your bank immediately as soon as you know that your card's been stolen, for example. Do banks generally, have you seen in your experience, they generally will work with their, their um, clients to reimburse that stuff or is it just depend on bank to bank? It depends. Okay. Case by case scenario. Um, however, one thing that I recommend to my clients to help bolster their fraud claims is to get a police report. Go to law enforcement and explain what happened and get a police report. And that police report will help corroborate your dispute to the bank. It'll also help when making a dispute to the credit reporting agencies, because when the credit reporting agencies receive a valid identity theft report, such as a police report, the disputed information must be blocked from appearing on your credit report within four business days. That's a very powerful right. Where's the future of this go? As technology gets more complicated um, and probably schemes get more, um, uh, just more efficient and less likely to be caught, I mean, where does the future of this whole area go, you think? That's yet to be determined. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, I don't think that we would have ever thought that identity thieves could go into a Michael's Arts and Crafts store and replace the card readers at different uh, cashier registers. We wouldn't have thought that identity thieves could go to gas stations and install skimmers on gas pumps for months and going undetected. Uh, biometrics perhaps mm -hmm. uh, will come into play and help uh, keep our personal information more secure, but biometrics is also uh, at risk for being stolen as well. You think about it, if you put your thumbprint yes. on, your, on your phone. Yeah. Uh, just to open it up if someone was able to access that. Mm. Uh, I know we're getting ready to go to break. Let's take a break. I'll just tell you this. Um, these thieves uh, have gotten so smart that the schemes that we see are even more complicated to pick up. Um, uh, and I can just tell you very briefly um, that even our law firm is susceptible to having people come to it. Uh, with these crazy schemes that appear on their face to be legitimate, mm -hmm. like uh, paying a court because we have a back um, a fee that we didn't pay when we uh, went through a filing fee. It right. sounds like a legitimate court and it looks like a legitimate court address that is theft um, to a new client calling and indicating that they need some, something paid immediately in order to be able to um, prosecute a claim or have us prosecute a claim for them. It's, it's pretty incredible, and you really have to have your guard up. You've got to be vigilant and be smart on what you do. But when we come back, I want to talk about some things that are kind of popular and trending mm -hmm. uh, in Micah's world and uh, just kind of talk about what happens if you have to litigate one of these cases. All right. We'll step aside. This is our final break of the evening. So just a couple of reminders. If you'd like to join the conversation, ways you can do so, you'll see there on your screen. Also, there's attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live right now to speak with you got a, about 10 minutes more remaining, so take advantage of that opportunity. Stay tuned. The final segment of The Attorney is coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright. If you've ever served on a jury, you may have wondered why there are gaps in the evidence you're given at trial. In today's Legal 4-in-1, we're answering the question, is there insurance to pay the verdict? Know this, just because the lawyers never mention insurance in a trial, it doesn't mean there is not insurance to pay the verdict. Rule 4-in-1 of the Alabama Rules of Evidence states this, evidence that a person was or was not insured against liability 
is generally not admissible or allowed to be discussed at trial in front of the jury. The reason for the rule is simple. A jury could award more money in a case if they knew the defendant had insurance to pay for it. But the reality in our state is this. In almost all lawsuits that get to a trial, insurance is there to pay judgments awarded by the jury. For example, all automobiles in Alabama are required to have liability insurance. Coverage can range from $25,000 up to $1 million in these cases. In theory, all car crash cases that get to trial should have insurance available to pay any verdict awarded in the case. Trucks have to carry anywhere from $750,000 to $5 million worth of insurance. Unfortunately, you'll never hear that during the trial. Even in medical malpractice cases, the doctor has liability insurance to help pay a judgment. That's something you won't hear during trial because the rules just don't allow that testimony. Yet almost all judgments against a doctor involve liability insurance. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our promise and pledge to you. At least we don't want to be number one on there. Well, there are 18 I others. I, yeah. I'd like to see that. Yep. Uh, <laughs> welcome back in to the attorneys talking about uh, everything you need to know to know your rights about uh, fraud, credit card fraud, and identity theft. Hey, uh, this is our final segment. So if you want to join the conversation, you'll see that information at the bottom of your screen. I would urge you go ahead and take advantage of that because the clock is ticking. All right. So uh, let's, let's talk about this. I want to talk about how these cases are litigated and, and kind of trends of what you see. But first, I want to ask, what are things that someone needs to look out for where you can say, hey, that's a sign of identity theft. Be, be cautious at that stage. What, what do you see? Absolutely. Josh, we kind of talked about, hey, go get your credit reports. Yeah. Look at those credit reports. See if there's any errors on those reports. Those errors can be red flags for identity theft. For example, if you have addresses that appear on your credit report where you've never lived, maybe not only a street number, but also a state, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it may also be accounts that don't belong to you. We see a number of fraudulent cell phone accounts opened up. So perhaps you've always had an account with Verizon, but now you see a collection account for AT&T and you've never had an account with them. Likewise, inquiries, hard inquiries, where someone has, a, has applied for credit your report has been returned, but it wasn't uh, an application that you made or authorized. Likewise, if you go to file your taxes and the IRS tells you that you've already filed your return this year and you've already received your refund, that's a strong indicator that you're a victim of identity theft as well. So let's talk about the litigation side of this. We talked a little bit about how, you know, generally lawyers that do the type of work that you do are compensated. Where do you get involved most? I mean, are you are you presenting a claim against one of the credit unions that has not done what they were supposed to do? Are you bringing a claim against the, the, uh, you know, the retail company that allowed the information to be stolen online? What, 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 all of the above, where does, where does it generally fall for you? Most, the most common claims that I litigate are under the Fair Credit Reporting Act where I'm representing a client in federal court who is suing companies like Equifax, Experian, TransUnion, the credit bureaus, or uh, in addition to the credit bureaus, perhaps the companies where the fraudulent accounts were open and the fraudulent information is being reported to the credit bureaus. We see it in the school loan uh, context as well, where fraudulent school loans mm -hmm. are taken out, the imposter doesn't pay the school loan, and then it's turned over to collections and reported to the credit bureaus. It's amazing that somebody would do that to another, you know, person, but it just, it happens all too often. You know, what's crazy to me is this stuff's not easy to do. And, you know, I mean, wh why would someone put so much energy into doing something illegal? You would think they would put this into like starting their own business or something. Yeah. I mean, you know, is it, does it not even surprise you guys the, the level of sophistication and the hard work and how creative these folks are? 
It doesn't surprise me. Frankly, um, identity theft is the number one crime in America and surpassed drug trafficking more than 10 years ago. Why is that? Well, someone can steal your identity sitting inside. They don't have to be on a street corner, right? So they can do it uh, inside. Right. They can do it through a computer. Uh, it's, it's much easier to mask their identity. Yeah. And likewise, one in 700 identity theft claims ends in an arrest. Not oh, a conviction, wow. yeah. but an arrest. So this crime is, is taxing our law enforcement and it's very difficult to prosecute these claims criminally yeah. as well. So the Fair Credit Reporting Act gives consumers the tools that they need, the rights and remedies yeah. to, to combat identity theft and the collateral damage. So one in 700, I mean, so it would seem to me that the technology somebody uses to be able to add a new, use an existing social security number, uh, add their own address, uh, and then go, you know, get a mortgage. It would seem like you could track all that stuff. We just don't have the resources to do all that? To some extent you can, yeah. but oftentimes there's additional layers in between that. Uh, but no, you're right. With some of the technology, for example, catching, capturing IP addresses, and then we can figure out which internet yeah. ser service provider it's right. associated with, and then we can figure out whose account it yeah. belongs to. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, in that context, yeah. sometimes law enforcement can be successful in prosecuting those. Who's problems. normally helping prosecute? I know we're getting ready to wrap up, but who's normally prosecuting? Is it the FBI? Is it local law enforcement? Both? What, what do you see most often? Oftentimes we're seeing joint task force okay. operations to combat these large identity theft rings. Mm -hmm. All right. Fascinating. Um, a minute and a half remaining, but I want to give both of you an opportunity for a final thought. Micah, you go first, please, sir. So it, for consumers, you need to know that you have these important rights under federal law. You have the right to get a free report. You should exercise that right. Get a report from Equifax, Experian, TransUnion regularly. And if you have any errors on those reports, dispute them. Secondly, you have the right to place a freeze on your credit file. By placing a freeze on your credit file, no one can obtain your credit report from Equifax, Experian, or TransUnion. You know, uh, this is one of those areas of the law, David, where you absolutely do not want to go it alone. Yeah. You want to make sure that you've got somebody that knows what they're doing. And there's a reason why Mike has been on our show four or five times over the last six or so years. And it's because he's such an expert in this area, knows the area of the law well. You want someone to lead and guide you through the process if you've been there, and Micah's a good example of that. Yeah. If you forget Micah's name, all you gotta do is come to us. Right. We're here every Sunday. We will get you in touch with Micah, even if it's six months down the road, to make sure that you're protected. But we wanna make sure these people yeah. understand they have recourse, they right. have a way to try and dig themselves out from underneath some of the fraud. Awesome information. Good Appreciate job. the time. Thank good you. Job. Good to see you guys. Good to see you as well. Thanks so much for joining us each and every Sunday night. If you uh, need to get in touch with the firm, here's how you can do so. Thanks again for being with us, and we'll see you next time on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.